Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Philip Martin, Senior Investigative Reporter, GBH News Center for Investigative Reporting and your host. Tonight, what is owed? Reparations in Boston and beyond. Boston has a complex racial history. It was the first colony to legalize slavery in 1641 and was one of the first to abolish slavery. Now Boston, like many other cities across the U.S. and countries around the globe, are taking a deeper look at the issue of reparations, how to repair or make amends for nearly 400 years of enslavement and political and economic subjugation of black Americans. What is owed? A new seven-part podcast produced by GBH News seeks to understand what reparations might look like in one of the oldest cities in America and around the globe. Now, its first episode, When a City Tries to Heal Itself, was just released. Joining us to discuss this exciting new podcast and our discussion are Jerome Campbell, who's the senior producer of What is Old, Soraya Wintersmith, politics reporter for GBH News and host of What is Old, Kelly Carter-Jackson, chair of the Africana Studies Department at Wellesley College and the author of Force and Freedom, Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence, and George Chip Greenwich, a member of the Boston Task Force of Reparations and the founder and director of Greatest Minds. Welcome to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you Thank here. You. Now, Jerome, talk about the podcast. Uh, mm. This is powerful. A podcast of reparations focused on Boston. Why and what are we going to be hearing over the course of seven episodes? Well, the why is, I mean, it's looking at the work that, that the city council uh, sort of put forth in 2022, calling for the task force. Uh, it came out of this question of if reparations is going to happen in Boston, what would it look like? And that's sort of where the, the, the series uh, sort of explores. It's looking at those questions, it's looking at the history that led us up to this point, and sort of all trying to add up to this question, if it's going to happen, what is it going to look like? Well, let's step back for just a second, folks, and let's talk about this, this notion of reparations. For a lot of people, it, it, it's super controversial. Mm. For a lot of people, I mean, uh, Kelly, you know this. Um, and the question becomes, when you have a situation where 77 percent, this according to a Pew study, of black Americans support the notion of reparations, but only 18 percent of white Americans support the notion of reparations, how do you even get from point A to point B with that type of differential? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's because most Americans are grossly uninformed. Most Americans are not aware of the history of slavery, the deep, violent history of slavery. They're not aware of the deep, violent history of segregation, of redlining, of how black people have been stripped from their wealth, stripped from opportunities to build wealth, blocked from entering schools for decades or centuries on end. Um, so we need to really have an educational process that talks to people about the meaning of this history, the meaning of slavery, and how it dispossessed people, how it marginalized people. And then I think people might have a greater appreciation, but I also think we have to talk about not just the past, but the present. So ongoing structural racism. What does that look like and how are black people marginalized or left out? I'm glad you said ongoing structural racism. That, of course, is what uh, Mayor Michelle Wu was talking about when she created uh, or appointed members of the reparations task force, including you, Chip. Uh, what uh, does what might this look like? You've had these discussions over the last few months about reparations. But if you were to repair, how do you go about doing it in, again, a city like Boston with its most recent uh, uh, episodes of racial uh, conflict uh, marked spe specifically by the 70s? But of course, we go much deeper, as we pointed out early, 1641. What does it look like? I think what we're going to have to do is really just slow it down and also listen. I think that's one thing. I think that um, in order for this to be a real true process is that we're going to have to really listen to the community, hear their voices, and find out a different way 
how we hear them. So sometimes the city of Boston and just tr traditional structures likes to do a meeting kind of Robert's Rules of Order mm. and so forth. Right. You can only speak for two minutes, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everyone that. You can't do that with reparations. Yeah. It brings up so much issues around trauma, mm -hmm. around people's family histories mm -hmm. and all these different things is that we're going to have to find a new way and a new structure in order to have this conversation so we all can be participate. And one thing is that I've been able to travel. I went to Evanston and I met with reparations um, task force around the country. Evanston, and I, Evanston Illinois, mm -hmm. right, all right? They had a conference where they brought all different task forces together. And I was able to go as mm -hmm. the, the only member of the Boston task force. So I got to listen and hear other people's strategies, how they were doing well, how they weren't working, mm -hmm. how the cities were working together, how cities weren't working together. But it gave me different insight of how to mm -hmm. tackle this work. Well, what are the controversial aspects of Evanston? Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it uh, as an example is that it's scaled. Uh, Evan, uh, you have Evanston, which is a relatively small place. That's right. But then there's Boston, there's Detroit, uh, mm -hmm. which is, of course, also looking at the issue of reparations. Soraya, when you talk about reparations, this you were brought in as host. You, you have, I, and I'm going to mention, folks, you've got to hear this. She, mm -hmm. she does a fantastic job. Yes, yes, and not yes, just yes. because she's my yes. colleague, but she does a fantastic <laughs> job. And, and, and I want to give her props. But I also want to talk to you about what you've learned. And the Evanston example is, is one thing. But what about when you're applying this uh, reparations to large cities and to, uh, to states like California, for example, which has a reparations committee set up? Yeah, I think it's really contingent on the process that Chip mentioned. In us traveling, Jerome and I traveling to Evanston, Illinois, we talked to political folks um, and community organizing folks who said that both of those things have to be part of mm -hmm. getting people on board. To Kelly's earlier point about community education mm -hmm. um, and making sure that people are not misinformed, whether or not they're willfully ignorant <laughs> about it is a different <laughs> thing. It's a major question. Um, and I want to talk about reparations, not just, mm -hmm. of course, in the context of when people think about reparations, they think only about the conditions that impacted enslaved people. Mm -hmm. But what about the issue, for example, and this is just one example, of housing? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize, of course, that after World War II, that you had reparations for white people. It was called, uh, the, it was loan programs, veteran loan programs, various types of loan programs, mm. which created American suburbs. Mm -hmm. The whole notion of giving out of loans and uh, subsidizing housing for white Americans was massive. Yeah. Uh, and of course, at the same time, you excluded black folk. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's have that discussion. Kelly, yeah. uh, how, does, how, do, how do reparations apply yeah. to that particular uh, factor in, in our nation's Sorted history. Housing sadly. is key. Housing is key because housing is one of the primary ways that people build wealth. That's first and foremost. When you have eight out of ten white Americans owning their homes and maybe five out of ten African Americans owning their home, that's a big discrepancy. When you think about things like the GI Bill, when soldiers returned home from war and they got these, you know, massive benefits to be able to buy homes. For example, in the state of New Jersey, they gave out sixty seven thousand loans for people to get homes. Only a hundred of those loans went to African. Americans out of 67,100. So you cannot sort of catch up to those kinds of numbers, especially when the value of those homes compounds over time from generation to generation. And black people don't have the ability to pass down that kind of wealth. So they're really left out of this racial wealth gap that only gets wider and wider and wider. But we've also had episodes in, uh, in time where reparations I mean, we're seeing now where there is, where there seems to be a, an, um, an acceptance of that historical fact that you mm -hmm. just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But there also seems to be a lot of resistance to history. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we see it in terms of textbooks uh, that are being banned right in places yeah. like Florida mm -hmm. yep. and Texas mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But we also see it in terms of attitudes and so on and so forth. So how do you, uh, with, well, I think I, I had this discussion with you, Soraya, uh, a long time ago. When you have so many people pushing back against the very notion 
of reparations, that they don't see the historical significance or see the past as something that should stay in the past. What do you believe can happen in order, if you will, to change people's minds? Obviously, this podcast is part, <laughs> is part of that so. answer. So, Jerome, Saran, what, what, what are your thoughts? Ooh. I think to the point about that earlier poll that you were citing, I think there's also the Pew a poll. Pew. There's also a question within it that asks how much people think that slavery impacts uh, black people today. Right. And if I remember correctly, I think a fair amount or a great amount, those two answers together was pretty high, like 60 or 65 percent. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, knowing that, I do not believe that it's simply a resistance to history. I think that most people do know that something impacts the statistics that we see about black people being disadvantaged. And so for me, it's more so a question of if we know that something bad happened and we know that black people are disadvantaged, and yet for a long time we've never wanted to have this conversation like there's something mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. that makes people not want to help black people catch up. I don't know what it is, but there's something. Would it be there. called racism? <laughs> <laughs> I can't, uh, I'm just curious. Uh, White Jerome. supremacy. <laughs> well, what, you, what your question makes me think of is how, when we were reporting, there seemed to be a way in which the continuum of history from uh, when black people, when, when the enslaved were freed till now, there's a way in which we talk about reparations only in terms of this one moment. Mm -hmm. And sort of when we, I think through our series, we're trying to sort of make that connection to say that it did continue past that point. Mm -hmm. It has different permutations. We can look at Jim Crow, we can look at housing. Mm -hmm. And when we sort of, sort of draw that line, the goal, I think the goal and the hope is for our work is that people are able to, sort, sort of be able to have conversations and say, okay, well, there's all these tangible ways in which we can draw, look, look at the oppression, of black pe the oppression of black people to this point, and maybe reparations is responding not just to this historical moment that we've been talking about, but is actually um, a part of the, like, the weave of America. Oh, the continuum, yeah. the yeah. continuum. Let me yeah. jump right in here. It's, it's very interesting. What I'm trying, what I'm hoping that the Boston Reparation Task Force will do is to localize this thing, even mm. though we hear all these mm. federal stories, which are very true and seeps down. But let's talk about my great great aunt who had a um, who had a house right next to Berkeley, where the Christian Science Monitor was, and how that was knocked down in order to, in the skies of urban renewal, mm. was actually you know taken from her and um, by a very little cost. And um, let's talk about those local stories. Let's talk about Charles Stewart um, and the way that he killed his wife and blamed it on a black man and watch to follow that. Mm -hmm. And you've got to think about the reckoning and repair of that, is that people don't realize, even though um, I, I grew up in Cambridge, but I also lived in the um, Mission Hill area with my dad um, in my um, high school and college times, I was a recipient of one of those scholarships. The family of this Carol Stewart, um, Damati Foundation, started a foundation to help the kids mm -hmm. and young people in Mission Hill with all the money that was raised after that. Mm -hmm. So this is a part You're of suggesting a, that's a that's a, 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 a uh, an example. Of example, and it's very much like I just mm -hmm. saw because I went to the open mm -hmm. um, the open screening of this here at WGBH. It mm -hmm. reminds me of the Quartermain story. You know what mm. I mean? Where it was shared in Savannah about how this woman sought out... That's the, the cost of inheritance. Uh, cost of inheritance. And remind about there's so many of these local stories that we need yep. to uplift and start sharing yep. about how this process actually works. Those so, stories are important. And speaking of stories, in this up... in the, uh, I'm just going to point out one upcoming episode of What is Old. Uh, again, that's a new pro podcast produced by GBH News. We learned about Belinda Sutton. Mm. She's a formerly enslaved woman who became the first person in Massachusetts to fight for reparations, and guess what? She won. Here's a clip about Sutton's story. I want to be very clear that that legislature is not saying, yes, we are actively and, and willingly wanting to give money to this 70-year-old black woman just out of the kindness of their heart. 
What they're doing is saying, there's a new government in town and the royals were loyalists. She was enslaved by one of the wealthiest enslavers in all of New England. And so it really is a way for them to try to punish people like the royals. So the legislature gives her an annual settlement of 15 pounds um, and 12 uh, shillings, which is supposed to help her survive and take care of a daughter who, sh who is sick. She gets that payment only twice. While it is important that she wins that judgment, it's even more important that she doesn't get all of that money and that she keeps fighting back for that money because she needs it, but also because she's owed it. But what it does, it shows us the ways in which black people are putting pressure on you know, the government, on elected officials to actually live up to the promises of freedom. Particularly because when we think about New England and the height of the transatlantic slave trade, people are talking about the abolitionist movement. That means that there's a lot of white help and white advocacy. But Belinda, I think, is a testament to black people doing their own thing. Yeah, black people have always been their own abolitionists. And generally we have tol told the story of abolitionists through white judges and lawyers um, and activists. But black people have always been at the center of that movement as well. So when we say that this document helps us understand reparations, I think it really does uh, do the work that so many people are grappling with today. How does, in Belinda's case, slavery, but then today, a long history of structural racism and inequality um, prevent uh, black people from being able um, to determine their own lives and livelihood? Soraya. Black people are, have been, always been their own best abolitionists. That's an incredible line, incredible notion. Um, from Frederick Douglass to Harriet Tubman to Belinda Sutton. Um, this was a remarkable clip. Um, what, did you, what did you take away from this? That Kiara Singleton is a wonderful historian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, you're excellent. You're also, I didn't know prior to sitting down with her and looking at the documents that Belinda filed, that black people, even as early as colonial Massachusetts, were utilizing the court system to sue for freedom, to, even in Belinda's case, as she was suing for a pension from her enslaver's estate, you can read her petition and see that she's also condemning the entire system. That means even with black people not being allowed to read or determine their own livelihood or control their own bodies or their own time, they recognize that something is not right mm -hmm. and write it into words that this is not That's fair. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Even as America is forming and folks outside are saying freedom and liberty and yeah. justice. This is, it's, this is amazing. And I have to, uh, and by the way, folks, this is uh, episode two of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, let's talk about the, because this particular podcast is doing something also mm -hmm. that's super important. And you mm -hmm. talked about this at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people don't know about the reason for reparations. Yeah. They, there's an assumption that it is based on, a, on a simply, again, the enslavement of black people. And that's not simple, by the way, yeah. because that's very complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Jerome, uh, in fact, all of you, if you could tell me, what are the next steps then mm -hmm. for getting, uh, if you will, the American people, and let's start, we'll just start with Boston and mm -hmm. Massachusetts, engage in an issue that where there, again, is so much resistance. Mm -hmm. How does the podcast do that, Jerome? Oh, I don't know if it's the podcast job. Well, the podcast, <laughs> yeah, the podcast helps. Yes. yes. I mean, I think that uh, the podcast is a place to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, again, I think that the, the idea is that we're trying to give people the tools to have smarter conversations. Yeah. I think that at the end of 2022, I mean, it's, well, I think during the pandemic, there was this idea of we're seeing a lot of people show up to protest that we haven't seen show up before. And a question of, are they going to stick around? And is, and is this support... Um, 
going to, you know, sort of last beyond this moment. So I think that the podcast is sort of saying that those conversations that happened then, we want to keep that momentum going. Uh, I think that bo- the way that the Boston Task Force is, uh, like how it got enacted and the work that it's doing shows that Boston um, is at least interested in that. So the, co- so the podcast is sort of saying, well, if that work is going to, that momentum is going to continue, how are we going to sort of empower the community to have better conversations around it? Mm-hmm. Uh, Kelly, what are you? One of the things I do in my classroom is we take field trips, and one of the field trips we take is to the Royal uh, Plantation and Slave Quarters. And my students are always blown away because they're like, we're going to a plantation? Are we going to South Carolina? And it's like, no, we're going to Medford. We're going, we're going to Somerville. We are going right into, like, the Boston greater area to learn about this history. And Kiera, I mean, she is an amazing tour guide, and she gave us so much information that I think it became really real for students to be in a space in which slavery very much existed, to tour the home, to see the slave quarters, to see the labor and the the, the work that went into living during that time. Um, I think that has a profound impact on people when you learn this history, when you live this. Can I just say one thing? Please. It's it's very important. Um, I went to school at Morehouse College in Atlanta. Right. So when I would always go around and say I'm from Boston, they'd be like, oh, my God, there must be no black people out there. And I tell them, oh, it's just me and my mom. That's it. <laughs> but real talk, it's this is a way for us to really show that Boston has a rich history of black activism, mm-hmm. black community mm-hmm. people, and the center where a lot of academia and also activists were born. Another thing is that we mm-hmm. gotta give it to Mich- Mayor Michelle Wu. This would never happen under a Kevin White administration, mm-hmm. Flynn administration, mm-hmm. Menino administration. Walsh administration, mm. maybe a Janey administration, <laughs> yeah. but you know what? But it happened under a Wu administration. Yeah. And so to have the discussion as one of the, the larger cities as the one to push this with the city council, it's very important. All right. You are spot on. I mean, the, the Boston is um, uh, Boston is unique because, people again, it, we think uh, oftentimes one dimensionally. Mm-hmm. And this is a way of thinking beyond mm-hmm. the, the tropes. Uh, and so on and so forth. And, uh, Soraya, what have you learned? I mean, I know you've been uh, to Evanston and you've been to other places, but what about Boston itself in terms of its um, attempt to uh, create um, reparations in various forms? Uh, what have you found in your reporting, uh, and what do you think is next? What I have found in my reporting is that there's a lot of tension around the task force still, um, and there should be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that folks have been waiting for a long time for Boston to be ready to have the conversation. Mm-hmm. And because in the first episode we say that we saw the task force get off to a slow start, it has raised some alarms for some folks, including some folks within the city and some folks who helped to create the task force mm-hmm. legislation. Mm-hmm. I think you will hear Chip later in the podcast say that it is up to people who want to see the conversation move forward to kind of keep pressure on the government. I think that much is true. Um, But I, I do also think there is some responsibility for the city to the tension Treat that you're, the task force yeah. a bit I haven't, heard, I haven't heard any of the podcasts. It just opened. Right, but the tension yesterday. you're talking about, the tension is based on what, essentially? Uh, you're saying there's three so, answers tension? And I'm going to let her tell the tension. <laughs> Slow moving process. I yeah. think when the task force got together, it was February right. of 2023, and then we didn't see them meet until. May for the first time, but that's about. But it's bound to be slow. Let me. Uh, I mean, when you're talking about a process that, where there's resistance, yeah. uh, and people are still even trying to define uh, reparations, it's going to be slow. Yeah. So Finally, you, get, you get sixteen different. You uh, bring different activists in the room. There are seventeen, eighteen different groups that have been doing this well, all across the country. All with a different, all interpretation. Have a different interpretation. Yes. And well, the minute that you stand up and say, "Hey, this is what reparation is," you'll get foot fucking people going to stop. Of course, no, it's not. a great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, we're, as, we, as we count down, uh, in 30 seconds, tell me what was the most surprising thing for you mm. about uh, exploring issues of reparations. Mm. And I'm going to give props to Randall uh, Kennedy, mm-hmm. uh, Randall Robinson, rather, uh, yeah. who, uh, t- t- who years ago, and uh, I'll give 
props to Randall Kennedy too, but but to Randall Robinson yeah, who, right. who who talked the about debt. the debt years yeah. ago. But what is the most surprising mm -hmm. thing that you uh, learned? For me, it's been that cities even or states want to even pursue this. That in 2024, that That's there right. is still an energy and a desire to even have this conversation. Jerome, I think it's. I think as the people that we spoke to in this podcast, I think it was, I was surprised to learn that the history of reparations had been ongoing so long in history and that some of the people who are doing the work are for, for a while are still around and can still inform mm -hmm. us about, you know, so we can have that connection. Chip? You know, you got to think back and really look at some of our Boston pioneers. That's um, many of our family members, our, our grandmothers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, Great grandmothers have been doing this work by putting their kid on the bus. That was a you know a form of activism to say you you know to get this thing moving forward. You got to get up to G. McGuire and all of them as well um, that have always pushed the thing. But the main thing is that reparations is a larger conversation that um, this city needs to have, and I can't wait to really push forward with the task force to do that kind of work. Indeed, in the thirty seconds that the conversation happens in waves, and that. No matter how far mm. back you look, there are always roots here. Mm. Mm. Excellent. Well, thank you. <laughs> this has been uh, amazing. And, folks, that's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. And I want to thank uh, all of our guests. Thank you for watching. And I'd like you to listen to what is old. It's on GBH News, on your favorite podcast platform. Now I'd like you to stay with us as we continue our conversation on our digital platforms, YouTube and Facebook. Thank you. I'm Philip Martin, senior investigative reporter, GBH News, and your host. We're on YouTube and Facebook with our post show, continuing our discussion on What is Old, a new podcast produced by GBH News about reparations in Boston and around the globe. And one of the questions I was wondering about, folks, is when you see uh, the issue, when you see reparations uh, that have been demanded correctly, uh, for example, by Japanese Americans, uh, who, uh, who in large numbers were interned con in, in concentration camps. Uh, I know they like to call it something else, but these were concentration camps mm -hmm. during World War II. And you see the uh, decimation of Native American populations across the country and Native people seeking um, reparations. Uh, what is the intersection of those uh, efforts, if you will, mm -hmm. what are the intersections of those efforts with um, those being sought by African Americans? I mean, what I appreciate about those instances is that they set a precedent. So I think oftentimes the question with reparations is, how can this be done? It's never been done before. That's not true. Talk we did do it. it with Japanese mm -hmm. Americans. We did do it with a handful of enslaved people that went and went to the judicial system and fought for their cases and won maybe a small amount of money, but won something. Um, we have an international precedent for it. If you look at, you know, Germany and Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. there is reparations that took place there. Even if you look at South Africa, there are like truth and reconciliation commissions that took place. We have models that we can build upon. We have uh, the way. I think the problem is we don't always have the will. Now, and Soraya, you, uh, you and Jerome spoke to someone in Aust uh, was it Austria? Yep. And talk about that. Uh, that is obviously a, a, a intersectional 
intersectional issue. And uh, how did that, uh, what did you learn from that? What was surprising about that? Secretary General Hannah Lessing let us know that there had to be sort of a national reflection point mm -hmm. in order for that nation to get to a place where it was wow. prepared to dole out reparations. Um, this is another thing that we learned. I didn't know a whole lot about Austria prior to doing the <laughs> podcast, but because of the way that Germany invaded, for a while, Austria thought about itself first as a victim and not as a perpetrator. And Though it collaborated with the... Uh, with the with and the, it with took right. someone in political power going, hey, wait a minute, like, we actually hurt people even as we were victims. Um, I think when I think about us here in the U.S. and the way that we talk about the U.S. Civil War and what it was and wasn't mm. about and how one side got heroicized even though mm. it lost, um, I think we're probably and your book bears. Yeah. Yeah. Into, into, into the lost into, cause. Into the lost cause. Exactly. Yeah. I think we're it, probably coming up on yeah. a national inflection point. Yeah. That. It, it's a, in, in fact, that is part of the issue. Part of the issue is you're dealing with revisionism, yeah. and, and if you're dealing with historic revisionism to to an extraordinary degree, yeah. uh, and yet you're trying, uh, yet there's an effort by uh, folks in Boston and elsewhere to to forge ahead with this notion mm -hmm. of reparations, again, uh, that accepted by only 18% of white Americans. Uh, Jerome, when you were doing this podcast, did you ever get to a point where you oh. said, wow, can this ever work? Uh, mm -hmm. Even as you were working on well, the I'm podcast. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. You know, I think it's, I think because this podcast was like inspired by people doing the work mm -hmm. and seeing it in motion. I think I'm optimistic. Mm. I think it's, I think that reparations feels like a phrase that when I think back like, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it felt like an imagination, like, like an imaginative idea. It was mm. a concept, it wasn't in practice, but to see people and to talk to people who have thought about this critically, who can point to points in history, who have plans, who have policy ideas, who are thinking about it politically, finding ways to put it into like the American political conversation, I was like, you know what, maybe, hmm. maybe. But you know, I gotta, I gotta say, as being an appointed member by Mayor Wu, right. it brings me great pleasure that I was mentored by Charles Ogletree since oh, I was yes. 22 years old. Yes, mm. so, the late, you know, great Charles Ogletree. Definitely. I've also, you know, we talked about the book, The Debt, Randall Robinson. I've yeah, met right. him through Charles and all these different people. Mm -hmm. met, um, sat with Mel King for years. So I get to bring all that great knowledge and all the great work that they've done mm. into my sphere about helping kick this down, kick this through the door. Yeah. And that's what my job is as a task force member, to use all that rich history that I know for years living in the Boston area, but also being around all these wonderful people, to be able to, it's a, like a game of soccer, you know what I mean? The ball goes down there and it comes back in there, and it doesn't matter who kicks it in the goal, we all had a part in doing that. You know, it, 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 I, I, your optimism, by the way, shows. You know, the, 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 Jerome. You know, he's, <laughs> Jerome's animated by by that your example and others. Mm -hmm. Clearly, yeah, that yeah. I think that's part of we. Because if, I think when when the conversations I've had with people, uh, they have been uh, decidedly uh, ones of despair. When you talk about when, it, when I when I've spoken to black people, mm -hmm. but then you bring up what has been possible. You talk about the things that you never thought could happen, and they happen. I, was, I remember sitting at one talk point about, about where uh, Nelson Mandela was sitting about where you are. I was mm. in South Africa when he was about to become president. This is the press conference. Mm. Can you imagine what people felt like when the wall was coming down yeah. Uh, yeah. In, um, in, in Germany and mm -hmm. so on and so forth? The notion that the impossible becomes possible. Uh, and so... What um, surprises you most about people's surprise <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about reparations? Uh, Soraya? I don't think that I am surprised. No, when... not, yeah, but you've come across people who are surprised, right? And it makes sense to mm -hmm. me when I think about the way that the conversation has happened in recent years. A lot of the questions that we seek to answer in the podcast are questions that would derail 
conversations, like in my personal life, yeah. like if you brought up the topic and maybe you weren't among black people who think that it's justified, it makes sense, the government should make it happen. Mm -hmm. If you're talking to a different audience that's like, no, it's not justified, and no, I don't mm -hmm. want to spend my tax dollars doing this in this way. When you try to have the conversation, you might get derailed by who gets it, mm -hmm. or how would the government pay how for much? it, or <laughs> how much? Yeah. What, yeah. what do we really owe you yes. if yeah, you yeah. weren't around and I weren't around? So to me, if that's the climate that we've been dealing with all the way up until 2020, it makes sense that people are looking around and going, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's possible now. Because for I a think, long time, we just didn't have it. I think, though, we, some of the conversation has to be reframed in the sense that I see reparations as a first step, not a final step. That's mm -hmm. right. It is mm -hmm. not something where you cut a check and we're good, right? right? Like, I don't owe you anything anymore. I think that there are a lot of people who do think that once you get reparations, somehow we've moved into a post-racial society, and that is just not how it works. You can repair a harm and still perpetuate harm after you have paid for what the damage that you did. Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of the conversation also has to be like, how do we stop structural racism? How do we the, impede this from ongoing? There's also yeah. another hidden conversation that has well, happened, which I've had with my friends at a Dominican and Cape Verde, Cape Verde, and I sit back and say, hmm, reparations? Well, you know what? I've suffered just as much being in this country since 1995 as you have. Why can't I also get some of these resources? In as this opposed world? to just the people, the descendants of enslaved So yeah. this has opened the door. There's some reparation activists that yeah. said any person that's this color is eligible. I mean, that's how I feel. I'm like, anti-blackness is global. Uh, right? It is well, global. It is. It is. So these are all the local, and this is where the local discussion comes in, the federal yeah. discussion comes in, the state discussion comes in. These are all different avenues where this thing, there's yeah. not just one definition. And pra yeah. in a, on a practical scale, how will it manifest? I mean, mm. I think if you, if you scale it on a, uh, again, the Evanston uh, scale, mm. If you look at uh, uh, Tulsa, for example, if you talk oh, yeah. operations in Tulsa, yeah. I think people seem to understand that. Uh, they yeah. seem to understand it less when you're talking about a national dynamic, a yes. national yeah. right uh, reparations. Um, but it also raises the question of how might things be repaired? Mm. Might it manifest mm. in terms of housing, mm -hmm. student loans, uh, mm -hmm. uh, forgiveness? Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts? All of the above. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Well, I think that one of the things that we that like we're exploring in the in the podcast is the idea that the harm defines the repair. Yeah. Mm. That history informs what needs to be fixed. I mean, looking at Evanston, they did a they conducted sort of like a historical review, decided what was what the harm looked like, and from there we get decide, we get the program. And I think that that's sort of, and I think sort of going back to Kelly's point, um, this idea of like responding to structural racism, the things that are maybe a little bit more intangible, I think that that is where the conversation about like finding the right type of repair, finding what exactly is needed to respond to this like structural issue is where uh, this idea of reparations moves from being like a one-off but to an go. actual mm -hmm. uh, solve. Mm -hmm. We're gonna we'll have to wind this down, uh, <laughs> but a final question. Uh, does DEI, which is greatly opposed right now as yes. a firm of action. Another loaded word, uh, right? Another word. Affirmative <laughs> action, DEI reparations. Yes. Yes. Best words. Diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion. Yes. Uh, if you find so much resistance to diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm -hmm. how can you therefore open the door, if you will, mm -hmm. to reparations? Or does DEI, affirmative action, open a door to reparations? I Very think quickly, it absolutely out. does. I mean, listen, Racists, racist, white supremacists, they deeply understand the power of history, what it means to understand the story of what happened. And I think that's where the groundwork lays. It's in the classroom, but it's also at home, like teaching our next generations, this is what happened. This is what's true. This is what we know. I think that history cannot, you cannot do reparations work without history. Without history. But I don't think you can do anything without history. Yeah. But reparations work without question. Uh, Chip? I think DEI is a tool, and I think um, companies, especially companies out here, is that they got to realize 50 years ago, 
um, of how America looked and Boston looked is going to be very different in 2050. Mm. And so it's about, you know, just in general, in the whole world, it's about China, it's about India, it's also about Nigeria now, because mm -hmm. Nigerian numbers are building. So if you don't speak Igbo or you don't speak Yoruba, you know, there's going to be a hard time because these, these companies, these, um, these citizens, think about it, in Nigeria and all that, everybody has a cell phone. And so if Apple doesn't know how to deal with the, the Nigerian population and the Indian population and the China population, they're going to miss out on a lot of resources and networks to stay competitive. And so it's a competitive advantage to actually use DEI as, as a way to stay um, viable as a company. Okay, we're going to give the last word to the host of our podcast. Let's hear what, what are your, what's your final takeaway, if you will, on reparations, where we are, and where we're headed. I think that black people are going to do what they've always done. Say that one more time. <laughs> say, say, say it again. I think that black people are going to do what they've always done it. and continue having the conversation no matter what. I hope, like Jerome said, that mm -hmm. our podcast does empower people to, it's a good goal yeah. to help them have different conversations and that this time maybe it will move forward differently. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Soraya. Chip, Kelly, Jerome, thank this you. has been a great conversation. We're out of time. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to end it here. Are we sure what we're going to a great discussion. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for joining us. I'm Philip Martin. Have a great night. <laughs>